Ladies and gentlemen, it is your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Hopefully, you can all hear me now. Really sorry for being uh, a little bit late with the stream. Uh, had some confusing computer problems. And as we all know, it's not an Ocean Liner Designs live stream unless something goes horribly wrong. Fortunately today, everything went horribly wrong off camera <laughs> in the lead up to the stream. Um, I do also have to own up to a mea culpa. This is a little bit um, embarrassing, but in the rush uh, to to put together nice graphics and things for the thumbnail. I uh, <laughs> Some of you guys have been debating what uh, what stateroom is depicted in the thumbnail uh, of this, of this uh, live stream. And uh, it may or may not actually be a render by Gio Castro, who does work on the Titanic Honor and Glory project, of a ship that is not Titanic. It is, uh, it is from the Britannic. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just going to leave it up. You know what? I'm going to own up to it. I'm going to say that was me. Um, a couple of you guys mentioned that it was, uh, that it was Britannic. You were right. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working weird hours recently. Give me a, hopefully you guys can give me a break. Um, good to see you guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, hello. And I'm sorry. We're already, uh, a little bit behind, but um, what I'm going to be doing is uh, launching straight in. Today we've got uh, a very exciting uh, guest panel. As always, we're going to be touring Titanic's first class. Uh, everyone's laughing at me for the for the Britannic mix-up. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Here to laugh at me for my mistakes. We've got the uh, our very good friends at Titanic Honor and Glory. We'll go straight straight into it. Um, we'll introduce them in no particular order. Off the bat, we have Mr. Matthew. DeWinkler. How are you doing, Matt? Hello there, Mike. It's great to be here. Yeah. Uh, it was nice to see that Britannic render there from Geo. You know, I like that space. I like that room a lot. So it's good to see some Britannic love. Uh, when I when I noticed that uh, earlier when you were having your technical problems, I had to do a double take. So, you know, no no disrespect. No, you know, we all make mistakes. And we got to enjoy a little bit of, of Britannic the way that she was intended. So it was nice to see her. This would have you know. been great for April 1st. Uh, but I guess so, yeah. But it is not yeah. April 1st. Yeah. Also There's joining us... No Britannic honor and glory. No, no Britannic no, honor and no glory. Addition, no additions to Britannic patroness of the Mediterranean. Nope, none of that. Nope. <laughs> also joining us is Mr. Carl Hudak. How you doing, Carl? Well, he's doing pretty well. Uh, he just got food, and I am... Uh, yeah, I'm very happy about that. Let's explore more of Titanic, I guess. Let's explore more Titanic. And also joining us for the first time. Unfortunately, he couldn't join us last time, but we've got um, the programmer for Titanic Honor and Glory. He's a, he's a friend of ours. He's a uh, very, very talented individual. Mr. Derek Vivier. How you doing, Derek? Hey, Mike. Doing great. How are you? I'm good, my friend. I'm good. I've got my coffee. I've got my water. I've already made a fool of myself, and now I can just sit back and let you guys do the talking <laughs> and avoid any, any chance. <laughs> Well, I decided to show up for this stream, and I'm excited to uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, what's coming up the pipe for uh, Demo 401, and you guys just can sort of get a, a, a little sneak peek at what's going to happen, and um, yeah, talk about uh, some of the stuff along the way with development and such, so this will be fun. Well, on that point, we um, we had a couple things you wanted to to show us. Um, you sent me over some special little preview images. I'm just going to get them up on screen right now. We're looking at the bridge of Titanic and uh, what happens here if I, if I slide my, my, my mouse over the screen here? Ooh. So this is a quick comparison um, between uh, how version 2.0 looks at the version everyone has access to right now and uh, version 2.1 um, it's we did some color grading and uh, the lighting's been rebaked um, in in much higher quality and uh, yes just some improvements and adjustments um, we've got another interior shot here um, it's a bit more subtle, but you can see it's a little bit warmer, a little bit, uh, uh, just looks a bit cleaner, I think. It looks real. I mean, one of the things that impressed me when I first fired this up, um, the, the, the first version of the demo was that you can walk around spaces and 
it just reminded me. I'd actually I mentioned this in one of the other streams, but I just got off Queen Mary two, and uh, yeah, a short nice. voyage. And it just felt mm-hmm. just like I was kind of back, you know. What's the one thing that's happened since um, uh, version two point came out is that I actually got a color accurate monitor, and um, I've discovered that uh, version two point has a slight very slight green hue um and <laughs> so version 2.1 is a little bit more natural in that regard i never noticed colorblind joke but it's funny yeah just comparing oh. them <laughs> you you see it does look more vibrant it looks warmer um and it just does look a little bit more like yeah it's funny this the the 2.0 almost looks there. like it's got a filter you know by comparison <laughs> So uh, one cool feature um, that is in v- version 2.1. Um, so uh, maybe I'll just quickly explain uh, what version 2.1 is. Yeah. Um, version 2.1 is not a major update. Um, it was the goal of it was sort of as a final bug fix update, sort of to cap off, uh, you know, demo 401. Um, just to fix some of the issues that people had in in version 2.0 and just a couple of little improvements along the way. Um, Unfortunately, over the past, I don't know, it's probably been six months now, um, basically development had been stalled on it because there were a few major um, engine issues. Um, What? one of the things was that I did was update the engine from uh, uh, 5.1 um, to to fix one of the bugs we were having. And unfortunately, Unreal 5.2 had a, a major issue that we couldn't, um, basically made it unusable. Um, if you saw the Patreon post, I, I kind of had a, 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 an example in there. And then, um, unfortunately, 5.3 also had an issue. Um, but uh, with the help of uh, a couple of people um, and, and some help from Epic as well, uh, we've uh, manually, we basically made a custom version of the engine that has some of the fixes backported from the next version of the engine into 5.3. And so that has allowed us to continue with uh, the light baking process, uh, which is going very well. And... Um, uh, now, so one of the features I do want to talk about is uh, it's it's basically a lighting dynamic range adjustment, and so some people prefer lighting that's a bit more uh, contrasty. You know, there's brighter windows, uh, the shadows darker, that sort of thing. Other people like just the opposite, and so this basically gives you three options and. Um, you have a low dynamic range, which is slightly, it's it's more it's more muted compared to uh, version two uh, two and then there's the regular standard dynamic range, which is about the same as version two and then there's a high setting as well, and that'll um, you know in in the high the it'll be harder to see out the windows, but it, in some places you'll get a really nice. Uh, like cinematic, uh, it's a really good cinematic feel for for screenshots and things. So, um, um, on top of that, we fix things like uh, reflections and uh, um, a lot of collision fixes we made as well. So, um, yeah, it's it's. Other than that, it's it's. Oh, we we actually did in- integrate some of the levels together, so there's a few fewer um, loading screens for people. Because um, I know, I know people like to just walk around seamlessly, so uh, we've we've integrated two major levels into uh, uh, basically we eliminated two major levels. Brilliant. Well, it shows because um, this is one of my favorite spaces on Titanic. So this is the uh, the deck just below the forecastle, the very very front of Titanic, um, where essentially the forecastle just functions as a cover almost for all of this like very delicate and complicated equipment that fires all the machinery on the on the forecastle deck like the capstans and things like that and yeah you can see in the uh in version 2.0 
it's quite gloomy. It does have like a green almost sort of filter over it. And this is, uh, this is looking very nice. So very, uh, very excited to get our hands on that. Today, of course, we will be um, playing with uh, touring with demo 2.0. Um, oh, no, yeah. But it's yeah, still going to look I, fantastic. I do want to mention um, real quick, of course, anything here, this, this is anything here is subject to change. Um, I just quickly went through and took, uh, um, took screenshots uh, today for, for Mike just to show off, just so we had something cool to show you guys. Um, but um, there's, we're still going to be doing a final pass where I go through and, and tweak every all the post processing in every single space. Um, so, you know, it, it may change slightly and, and, you know, we'll kind of, we'll be discussing as a team, um, you know, sort of light, light levels, you know, how bright we want certain spaces. So it, it might change slightly um, just from what you see today. You've been very busy. Someone pointed something out very, uh, just now that uh, and this is a really good point never noticed this the wheelhouse here we've got half planking and half steel like exposed steel now i know that a good chunk of this structure was just made of timber so it wouldn't interrupt with the um with the ship's magnetic compass or wouldn't in interact with it um never noticed that half is plated and half is steel is that did, did it the steel is it's funny how it kind of overlaps that bulkhead there leading into the wheelhouse Yeah, indeed. You know, just the that the top roof over the the navigating bridge just goes to a certain points, and then it became steel. And there's that little like lip of steel that's kind of resting. Well, it was resting for a while on Titanic's wreck. I think it's finally fallen down. That was over like the um, the chart room and the pilot's room, and it had the this the skylight that was overhanging. Uh, for the longest time still the whole to the sky to the chart room so yeah it's just half and half kind of and i guess it's that, it's at that point where the steel i guess wasn't affecting it anymore i guess above it um you can see steel in olympics uh uh wheelhouse photograph right above this area too was that so, a, yeah, a holdover that's for when or incorporated this uh double like ceiling sort of say because i know that at a certain point titanic's bridge structure differed from olympics and i'm just going off memory here but my understanding mm -hmm. was that this bulkhead sat further on olympic in 1911 than it did on titanic could that be like a holdover from when maybe that bulkhead was sat flush with where the steel ended uh yeah well olympics wheelhouse was gigantic compared to titanic's you know it went all the way uh aft to the um stokehold vents uh and there was just a, pretty much like a waste of space really her her Olympic 1911, her chart room and her pilot uh, room were uh, on port uh, side of the officers' quarters. The Titanics were moved uh, on the center line. They, they did a huge reshuffle of the entire officers' quarters. So, uh, yeah, it was essentially pushed further uh, forward on Titanic. So it, it, you know, a, lot of a lot of Titanic is essentially just olympic you know we we go back and forth in our uh discord our, our design discord for titanic saying like well olympic was basically the the keystone for titanic so at a certain point they built everything twice and we have to incorporate that into titanic because there wasn't time for them to go back and change it even though they changed it on olympic at a certain point so it was already built for titanic well they, you know they already cut out the steel for it and they would have just covered it up with different paneling we uh, if you think about um i know the aft grand staircase on titanic and olympic later on in, on olympic when they added the cabins that thomas andrews was in and um francis brown they on olympic when they added the cabins there were originally windows there and they made the windows when they on the paneling into mirrors we also now think that those windows were originally built on titanic's paneling and they also would have had the mirrors there in the aft grand staircase paneling too so we have to add those mirrors to the aft grand staircase in our in our demo in our game as well wow. to make that accurate too because we think by the time that titanic was being built they made the paneling at the same time so yeah olympic and titanic built kind of at the same time and they just were ready to build everything so they're more or less being done at you know they're holdovers on each other so yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, on the on the topic of uh, Olympic uh, and building Olympic, um, nice segue. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's, you know, being mm-hmm. host, you gotta you gotta keep it. <laughs> <laughs> Try and keep it. It's a topic. Although yep. us lot are want to uh, get into long and lengthy discussions about um, other things than, than what we have got officially programmed. <laughs> um, but uh, Jack, our our uh, well, he's he's Titanic and Glory's media um, animator, and he also animates for um, Ocean Liner Designs. And uh, he wanted to get this in. He was meant to be joining us today, but couldn't make it. This is a teaser. What exactly for? I don't know, but uh, this is Olympic up on the stocks, painted white, because as the class leader, of course, they want to get a nice photograph, have her looking all gleaming, and of course, having a, a white hull against a grey city with all black and white photography back then was was very impressive. So Jack's working on something, um, and some some absolute mad lad made the Aral Gantry here that you can see in the background. Um, any any have... clues as to who that might have been? Hello. Mm-hmm. You're owning up to that one. Oh, I, uh, I absolutely am owning up to that one. I, uh, I may have um, accidentally made the gantry just a little bit, and also the rest of Belfast. Kinda. It's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, we Definitely. can't wait to see more of it. Obviously, Jack's got something in mind. Um, so, watch this space, Acc- I guess. Accidentally makes Belfast. We've all done it. <laughs> Yeah, we've well, all I mean, done you it. know, it just it just happens, you know. I, I want to make the gantry, and I'll well, make the other side of the gantry, and also the gantry's next to it, and these buildings that are immediately immediately next to it. Oops! Oh no! I just realized you could see a whole bunch of the city from the top of this gantry. I better make the whole thing. Eventually, yeah. the entire British Isles are are created by Kyle Hudak. Yeah. That's <laughs> how the snowball works. So relatable. Yeah, we've been going through the same thing with uh, Grand Voyage, actually, where we, we keep noticing, oh, now we have to make this. Damn, what a shame. Um, what we're doing at the moment is firing up uh, the Titanic Honor and Glory demo. Uh, we're going to go into first class, and I'm going to head on up to where we left off last time, which is, of course, Titanic's first class lounge. So we'll just give my uh, machine just a minute here to boot up. Um, last time, just to give a little reminder of uh, where we've where we've been uh, in the first tour, we were looking around. Um, I think we spent a lot of time in the gym. That was especially entertaining. I think a lot of people found that found that really really fun because some of that machinery is bizarre. <laughs> but you guys did a great job of explaining it. And then we headed on up to the uh, we, were, we were through the gym, the first class entrance. Um, we're going to spawn in here. We're back in the uh, the first class entrance, but we're going to head up now to the lounge. So please feel free to uh, jump in at any time, but we are just gonna head on up to a deck here, down this little corridor and head, oh, here's our beautiful grand staircase behind us. Gorgeous. And we'll head on in. Fashump, fashump, fashump. That's the sound the revolving doors. <laughs> Because All right, here's an interesting the sound one. Of the demo. What was yep. the function of the revolving door? Was this a smoke prevention thing because people were smoking or... Ah, the discussion of the revolving doors. Time to talk about them for 10 minutes. So, revolving doors uh, have the same function that they did um, 100 years ago that they do today. They are for the for uh, traffic control, air control, sound control, uh, indeed they could be for smoke control. They they don't just revolve; they also fold. You can see there there's some like uh, hinges on a bunch of the doors. They can fold. They can be locked into place in an, an X position and at various angles. They can also fold in on themselves and then be uh, on the pivots. Can be opened up so that's an entire like free flowing corridor. You know for the you know how else would you get move the furniture? into the lounge and the reading and writing room. Uh, you know, when the, when the room has to be locked up at nights, that's when you secure the revolving door, which is probably what occurred on the night of April, uh, the morning of April 15th, 1912, when, after Titanic hit the iceberg and they extinguished the lights in the lounge. So yes, the revolving door is a very important aspect for the ship because also the ship, it, you, know, you were, if you're out on sea on any ocean liner, you encounter the um, negative pressure of 
once you open a uh, exterior door and an interior door, it especially happens in your in your cabin if you have a balcony. If you open up one yeah. and the other, you can have a, like a wind tunnel effect. So this is really helpful for preventing a sudden gust of air going down the corridor into the lounge and all the ladies enjoying tea and the gentlemen playing cards, a, a giant tornado effect, um, creating a mess in the first class lounge. So yes, they weren't. these doors were not originally on Olympic, so it's something that were uh, added to both ships um, when it was discovered that they were needed. Interesting. Yeah, they must have had mm -hmm. some, some serious drafts whipping up and down this deck right. because it's so continuous as well. I mean, you can see all the way through Indeed. to the very, very front mm -hmm. superstructure there all the way aft. Um, a good On that note, third of the length. Does anybody, does anybody remember these, um, re the funny uh, revolving door physics in earlier versions of our demos? You used to be able to, like, fling yourself around in them. These, these were ki kind of a nightmare to to get working right, but they're so worth it. <laughs> well, they're working fine. Um, I'm not being thrown anywhere. <laughs> so yeah. We won't put that in Thomas Andrews' notebook for fixes. They're very heavy in real life. It's bizarre because you can encounter a pair of Olympics revolving doors in Anik, the White Swan, and you can, you can uh, get some nice momentum on them, but they're still there. And they're pretty substantial. I remember going back to uh, Lost in the Darkness because uh, that video that first went viral of us walking around the Titanic and Lost in the Darkness. I I think that I think there's some weight on those doors. But yeah, our first demo, it's just they go, whoosh, and it's kind of funny. You got to start somewhere. Yeah. Interesting. All right, so we're heading through, um, and we'll come into the lounge, and um, this is where we left off last time, and this is. Probably my second favorite uh, interior on on the ship. Mm -hmm. I wanted to start out looking at um, this little statue because uh, this has been found in the debris field. It was found all the way back in the 80s, as I recall, right? Mm -hmm. Almost intact, never raised, I don't think. It was never brought up. I don't know. Yeah, we... Uh, uh, nobody, yeah. knows. Uh, nobody knows. Nobody knows. What? Nobody it, knows. It, it vanished. No, it hasn't been seen since. Right. It was photographed what? in the '80s. Uh, so there's a lot of. Uh, I'm not going to get in trouble because. But yeah, there's a lot of like, uh, backroom discussion of what happened to it. It was it was photographed, I believe, by Robert Ballard's uh, team by the, uh, the the sled ROV that went around and just took pictures of the entire. Uh, rec sites and it was seen uh photographed with a bunch of fallen uh bold uh, rocks and boulders that they assumed came from icebergs that were melting overhead and they dropped their boulders down and so yeah it was half submerged in the in the mud and it was clear it was very obvious what it was it was uh diana goddess of the hunt or artemis a, a, a smaller replica of the statue that you'll find at the at, Vers at the Palace of Versailles, I believe, or it's in the Louvre yeah. now. I, I, I forget which one. This statue is everywhere. If you walk outside the, the gardens of the Louvre, you'll find a replica of the statue. Um, and indeed, it's 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 a little it's a little statue, but it's still uh, substantially like. I, I'm sorry for everyone who's knows the metric system. I I know it's about two and a half feet tall, uh, but yeah, and it it was bolted to the fireplace of the lounge. And it was in the debris field, or so we we believe. So mm. to understand that that statue was uh, jettisoned from the bow of Titanic uh, during its descent to the bottom, there were some impressive forces um, at work there. Hopefully, not sitting on someone's mantelpiece now. <laughs> uh, it, it could it could very well be, <laughs> but yes. That classic thing about Titanic is like you have to. Watch what you say, because you may accidentally <laughs> uncover an absolute. I'm, all, I'm always offending somebody, trust me. But yeah. yeah. My, uh, my computer's being a little bit slow this morning, and uh, every time I look around, things are popping into view. So that's actually my machine, because uh, I haven't configured this properly yet. Titanic lives in the Matrix. <laughs> so tell me about this room, guys. This is um, was iconic in the film. They, they made a, a miniature of the room. They didn't actually make it full scale, but there's a great shot 
of uh, a, a woman floating past this chandelier right at the end as Titanic sinks. It's a very special. For some bizarre reason, yes. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, beautiful room. What was the, the fundamental purpose of this space? Well, this this room is uh, its purpose. It's a it's a lounge. It's a, a meeting room. Uh, you could come here for, uh, it wasn't as popular because they introduced the first class reception room, uh, but uh, here you could have tea, coffee, play games, read books, uh, socialize, just sit, relax. Uh, it connected to a, a, a substantially sized uh, bar and pantry uh, further aft. Uh, this was intended to be the first the, the main meeting space for first class passengers aboard these ships uh, right there's ample seating space as you can see here uh, some very comfortable chairs chairs uh, sofas uh, settees and some wonderful Chesterfields and you have uh, an ample library right there of books that are um, all bound in the white star line uh, binding uh, that's that's uh, Every every so often, new books are brought in, all rebranded with the White Star Line uh, bookends. Also on either side are uh, cabinets for games, uh, magazines, newspapers, and uh, also you can. There's a little Andy. You spoiled me. You spoiled it. Yeah. There's there's two cabinets on the other side of this. Um, which is actually the boiler casing for the third funnel, right here. If you go, if you head towards the um, the other corridor, there's these two little cabinets right there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you, you saw one. There's two cabinets. Oh, yeah, I saw it. Go to the other side. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone wonders what these little cabinets are for. Are they display cabinets? Are they? Um, are we missing like a clock or something? Are we missing some sort of mechanical equipment? Um, but they are. Uh, little cabinets for, uh, according to, I believe it's the auction catalog or Britannic. I'm not sure off the top of my head. I have to check. But it's for, um, like, a display here, like, candy. So it's, it's um, this room has many purposes. And it is very lovely. Um, I've obviously inspired by the Palace of Versailles, or so they say. There, it's, a, it's a musically inspired room. Right there, you can see a carving. Um, on that that small pilaster that has musical notes and um, instruments, and that's that you can find them today still, not Titanic's of course, but Olympics in the White Swan again at it, it, Anik uh, the hotel. But the room that actually proved to be more popular than this room, even though this one is beautiful, is the first class reception room on D deck. But this is everyone's like favorite room it seems because of just how luxurious it really is it also also melts computers it does, <laughs> yes yeah my yeah, uh somebody... oh my god there's a hole there's no no, a hole no there the isn't wall. everything's fine everything's fine oh there's a hole in the wall i haven't got to set this up properly oh, for no. our uh, for our oh, no, the ship's breaking oh, apart no. the humanity do you have it on a, a hard drive that's probably yeah that's this is uh yeah. this is again user error so don't uh, don't be looking at these guys yeah, like they, yeah, they've got holes you in their need shirt. an ssd to really uh, play this yeah worst, yeah 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 i'll make sure you'll be, you'll next be stream, fine I'll once you it. get away from the lounge i'll have it all sorted out it's oh, interesting well, these um well, speaking of getting away from the lounge somebody said that their favorite room on the olympic class is the reading and writing room let's so go have a what look. is the reading and write let's find out let's go check it out yeah 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 but let's have a look through here it is, a, it is a beautiful room. I might, we'll come back to this uh, next time when I'm running this properly because I think that we'll, we'll give it some proper love. Um, Letterboxes the here. The, the P.O. box right there. Yeah. I think I saw someone mentioning that in the, the chat about the, the P.O. box. That's where you, that's one, that's one location where you can uh, drop your mail off. Another location is down in the purser's office on C-Deck or just give it to a steward and they'll, they'll deliver it to the proper uh, place. Brilliant. Which is just at just the purchase office, pretty much. Well, let's go and have a look at what is probably the most um, almost Cunard esque probable interior on Titanic, in my opinion. Um, That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like they ripped this out of Lusitania, but God, because is it beautiful! White. Yeah, this is gorgeous. Where are we now, gents? 
uh, the reading and writing room. Still on a deck, obviously. Um, but this room is intended was intended. I have to use past tense. I forgot, which is unfortunate because these ships aren't around anymore. Was intended to be uh, just a, a quiet space for, I guess, reading and writing. Uh, you would come here to uh, write your correspondence, uh, read a book as well. Um, it turned out to not be another popular space. Uh, it was criticized. Uh, early on on Olympic for being a very bright room, uh, not because of the windows, but because of all the light fixtures bouncing off the white walls. And another criticism that I said a second ago was that it wasn't that popular, and it was intended for a Titanic and Olympic for one of their earliest refits, which was going to come, uh, which never came for Titanic, obviously, was that lovely little archway right there forward. Uh, that alcove, which is pr which could be arguably the the nicest feature of the room, besides perhaps the fireplace and the hearth and the bay windows, was going to be removed and replaced with uh, cabins, and was replaced with cabins in the design for Britannic, because that's how unused the space was by passengers. This whole room um, had somewhat of the archaic concept of the space for the women, own, and as the space for the men was considered the smoking room. On other ships, on other lines, the smoking room was men only. That wasn't the case necessarily on White Star Line, but even until the 20s, you would have smoking rooms which were designated as uh, men only, with even signage outside saying the smoking room is for men only. That, that wasn't the case on Olympic and Titanic, even though... If a, a a lady would walk in, certain men would probably get all huffy and puffy, perhaps. But yes, but this room um, is is does seem to be, I guess I'll call it a, a fan favorite, um, perhaps for its brightness, perhaps for its use of colors in the fabrics. Uh, yeah, it's it's the reading and writing room. Uh, uh, the, I would I'd like to briefly bring up something. If you want to play this demo, it is available for free on our website, titanichg.com. There's a click on the Project 401 tab, and there is a way to download it. I've seen it mentioned in the chat a couple of times. This is free. You can you can just download it and play it. Uh, you do need a fairly up-to-date computer with a, a reasonable specification. Um, so, but some of the details are on that page as well. So enjoy. Yeah, you've got about half of Titanic that you can explore at your leisure, which is pretty remarkable. Um, go and check it out. Um, Very cool. So I just get lost looking around these rooms. They're just absolutely spectacular. On an extra, on an extra, extra note, and, and I guess this applies to a lot of stuff in uh, Demo 401 here, because uh, a lot of these models are on the older side, but this room in particular has a lot of really old and low detail stuff and i think some of the materials even uh were never like finished so um it, it's not the best it could be then you know the light fixtures are i think those matt when were those light fixtures made those uh, wall sconces I, th I think obama was in office yeah. <laughs> so they're pretty old uh, thanks obama back in the cry <laughs> the, the cry engine crisis mod days uh so of course yeah but the room still looks pretty nice uh despite that yeah there's a couple yeah, of uh, well, what i really like about this room and and also probably the lounge and the uh smoking room is it it shows the way that they thought about like, kind of like you know literally raising the roof on this so this has a, a little deck house above it that adds what like an extra three or four feet of height um and gives more natural light because now you can see here are the the deck plates and the deck beams for the boat deck and you can just see above that these little kind of like skirting windows that follow the bulkhead mm -hmm. and you can see the deck chairs that would be sitting up on the boat deck raising the height of this room considerably over um other other rooms on the ship which had probably like a maximum height i think down on uh d deck was something like maybe 10 to 12 feet is that right on d deck uh 10 and a half feet yeah yeah mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah, this is the tallest deck on Titanic. You, you, it brings it up to, uh, is it 12 and a half feet, I want to say? Or 
uh, off the top of my head. Yeah, the the raised roof uh, I think is a foot and a half. Uh, in those celestial windows, really bring in a lot of extra lights. Yeah, and it's an, a nice added feature, especially in the first class lounge. I know we just left, but mm. uh, there, you know, they have stained glass windows uh, up on the boat deck allowing you know a, a completely different feel and, uh, and we'll get to the smoke room too i'm not sure did we look at the smoke room last time i forgot no no but, we didn't know, get that far off yeah yeah okay yes well we can gl- glance at those windows too yeah There's, those are gorgeous. that's another beautiful thing too on yeah the, they um, really uh sorry go on it oh go ahead yeah i'm just gonna glow about windows forever <laughs> well, I was we'll, gonna, get there. We'll, we'll get there we'll get there well yeah we'll go and have a look i was just going to talk about your point on the the fact this little alcove was going to be um essentially like turn into cabin space. It's like one of the things people mm-hmm. often ask is how and why was Olympic bigger than Titanic after her refit after Titanic sank. And um, it brings up the whole thing about gross registered tonnage, the way that they used to register the, the, the size of ships. And um, although it sounds like it's a measure of weight, um, it is really a measure of internal volume that is usable. It is enclosed space usable by passengers and um, promenade space doesn't count because essentially if it's got if it's open at either end if it hasn't got four walls and a roof um, and it, it's machinery space it's, it doesn't count mm-hmm. so Olympic after Titanic sank had um, huge portions of her spaces closed off that were previously open promenade so that added to her gross registered tonnage and brought her about level with Titanic and then spaces like this were uh, converted into cabins and then unused parts of the promenade were converted into cabins that actually made her gross registered tonnage, that internal space, greater than, than Titanic's had been, therefore making her larger than, than Titanic. Although, of course, their d- dimensions were identical, essentially. Um, so, yeah, just an interesting little I think it was recently discovered uh, by Mark Turnside that Olympic was launched bigger than Titanic, and then um, after she, after Titanic sank, she became uh, larger again, which is ironic, you know, that we talk about Titanic being launched as the largest ship in the world, but Olympic somehow, um, you know, they measured her, et cetera, as you just explained, was bigger at launch than Titanic was. Um, yeah, Olympic did it know, first. Olympic did it first. <laughs> oh, but, hey. but Titanic... It's Titanic. Gentlemen, why don't we head up to the boat deck for a quick turn and maybe uh, take a look through the windows from above? Yes, let's go and stretch our legs, shall we? Okay. And back down this little revolving door. Do you want to do your sound effect again, Matt? I will. Oh, it only turned one. Okay. It turned <laughs> once. I thought it was going to keep going. We got one for sure. You could also go out the door. Oh, oh, uh, oh wait. To your behind um, you, to your right. Uh, before we do, uh, hmm. did we ever go forward on a deck in those corridors to see the bathroom and the cabins? No, let's go and have a look. Do you need to have a bathroom break? Yes. <laughs> I know. I made sure to go before we start. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I do like this space because you can actually see the um, forward expansion joint here, which helped Titanic superstructure bend and flex as the hull did below it. Um, and mm-hmm. not cause cracking, which is very important. Here are the, the simple, as we, we call them today, but they're just staterooms, A deck yeah. staterooms, A1 through 35. And this is steel rooms. paneling? Is this exposed steel on the... on the? Um... Yeah, just exposed steel. I know it's a shocker to many people that mm. this is first class on Titanic, but it was very... Um, simplistic it's not the ornate uh magnificence uh corridors that we're used to from movies and cinema it's it's down to earth um uh white painted walls exposed steel there was plumbing in cabins Mm. it it was it's it's this is what it was mike check out that view through the window yeah wait Use your scroll wheel. You can zoom in a little bit. I was going to say it kind of makes up for it for oh. the fact that you have probably the best view on the of all the first class cabins. The that, that guy true. over there with his arms out. What is going on? Shut up, Kyle. I can't believe you said that. <laughs> Someone should really tell it, tell the crew they're not allowed forward of that sign. <laughs> uh, 
Um, oh, yeah. Mike, what's in that door off to your right? Let's go and have a little look. What I do like about this stateroom is that it seems like the furniture and all the items have just kind of been dropped in at random. Yeah, kind of. Uh, well, that one chair is. It doesn't belong there. But oh, <laughs> everything yeah. else, I, yeah. I believe what's the, the, there should be a Toby chair that goes there, right? There should be a nice Toby chair. Yeah, bizarrely, the the chairs, the wicker furniture from Dryad, they have, you know, well, a lot of furniture today is still named for some reason. You know, the the brand names, they all have odd names like this is the the wellington chair or something i don't know but and ikea yeah like well that's ikea they have i i can't i don't want to talk about this what the swedish name their furniture but yeah the <laughs> the the type of wicker chair and commonly found in cabins was named toby after toby from the office and that's the type of chair that would be in in uh, many of the first class uh, staterooms, but we put in. We, we haven't modeled that chair yet because modeling wicker furniture is rather difficult. Mm, yeah, very detail we, heavy. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And so um, this, what's this interesting here is you've got, a, a, in theory, if were the ship heading um, east, coming back to to the old world, you would have a sunrise and summer that would be coming mm -hmm. straight in through this window, right? So she's been fitted with some nice little wooden shutters. Yeah, these are um these cabins are uh are nice and they were i were they more expensive i think i can't remember off the top of my head i checked check my notes but they are always um more desired you know obviously cabins with windows are but uh, overlooking uh the front of the ship uh even today uh cabins are uh requested so but what a view you, you would get there yeah um, and these cabins sunset oh. sunrise Oh, there's a crack in the window frame. Well, let's not talk about that. Anyway, so the, these cabins here, are they larger than a lot of the others on A-deck as well? They seem larger, wider. A-4 and A-3? Uh, yeah, they're yep. much larger. Uh, they're, they're, they have an actual uh, settee and a, a table. Uh, no other cabin on A-deck has those. So this is the closest that you would get to an almost a uh, full-on stateroom on on a deck besides the two around the um aft grand staircase you also have the larger uh beds which are behind mike right now which are very bizarre they've been spotted in the wreck these these double beds in the ship um all the ca all the cabins on a deck have the single berths but in a3 and a4 uh the outward cabins have larger double beds double beds as in they are just wider they're not technically designed for two people but with, you know they, they could in theory have two people all the all, all the other berths only could fit one it's a it's much wider and these cabins have them i recall so yeah, these are from the ghost bigger. of the abyss expedition that james cameron did that these are i think it's brass frame beds mm-hmm yeah, that um, because the bedding was in contact with that metal, because the metal has a slight positive charge, it meant that the bedding hadn't deteriorated by about when when he went. Maybe it was like two thousand or two thousand one, two thousand one. Yeah, and the yeah, bedding was still there's, intact. <laughs> the sheets. There's like there's like a um, I, I think it wasn't like sheets of the bedding, but um, like it was like it was like a piece of fabric that was hanging off of um, I think a bed post. And it's it's remarkable. The the it was you know it's not like perfectly preserved where you can see the pattern in the in the the sheet or anything, but mm. it's it's clearly distinguishable as a a piece of clothing compared to every no, not clothing but cloth compared to everything else. Yeah. And the the only explanation is because it's um was draped over the the brass of the bed, and you have that weird uh, reaction between the metal and what happens to the water and everything and that's why certain uh woods survive they're protected by in contact with um the metal of the ship sometimes you know uh or they're like just they're like in a nice little like uh caved area of the sh uh protected from the currents too mm. and yeah. they can live and sometimes you see weird things too like if you ever look at 
wreck footage, you could see the decking on the the steel. You had steel decks covered by wood planks, and the wood planks were held on there by steel bolts, and they had uh, caulking like tar between them. And on the wreck, the wood's mostly been eaten away, but you still have all the lines from the tar, the caulking, and you also have bits of wood, chunks of wood where the steel rivets were holding them down. Amazing. Someone in the in the comments mentioned that um, the oh sorry I, hope I didn't just cut you off so I uh, I've got a slight delay. Um, someone in the comments mentioned yeah, but what about the noise of people promenading above? And uh, this stateroom, by my reckoning, is probably directly below the wheelhouse. Is that right? Yeah, uh, it's yeah. It's, there would have been nobody promenading above. Yeah, here. on the other side. But there would there were um, sign. Well, we'll see those signs when we go on the A deck promenade. Because Ooh, yeah. they, the the White Star Line did oh. take notice of the comfort of these passengers when thinking about early morning morning risers promenading on the A deck deck. So we'll talk about that later. Brilliant. Mm-hmm. I was going to say another okay. interesting fact about Titanic and first class. So we think of the uh, the absolute luxury, but of course, even in first class, you have shared bathrooms <laughs> mm-hmm. it's very it's it's one it's arguably one of the reasons why olympic was eventually scrapped i mean there's a couple of reasons you can argue um but you know britannic was the only sister of the three which had almost all cabins in first class but not all but almost all to yeah. have yep. uh their own how have i never seen that sign before how have you never I, seen I, that i sign have before? literally never seen the sign before it has how to be never read see the sign uh the no. programmer of titanic honor and glory it has to be read in that voice like that is made from the movie voice where he's like two you know. <laughs> two questions two questions uh first of all uh, the, the the Britannic that is one of the most notable sort of interior changes, isn't it? Uh, at least in first class, is that they just added little bathrooms to most of the cabins. Yeah, they added little bathrooms and they added a lot, a lot of more, a lot, a lot of more, lot, never more, lot, a lot more sinks. Mm. And yeah, what actual is sinks. that? What is the toilet sign based on? That, an actual sign from Olympic. Really? Yes. Well, so at is least this from wording White Star Line, actually at least from White Star Line. identical to wording that was actually put on a sign on Olympic? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it's not it. a made-up sign. It's 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 um an it's from uh the arc I believe the archive. It's from our national uh, NM and I archive. Unreal. It's yes. Yeah, so. so it is. It's not something that we've made up. We, you know, we make up a lot. I make up a lot of signs on board Titanic. Uh, like oh, the, nice. the, the time, like the the sign on the gymnasium, the Turkish bath, and the, the barbershop. Inventions of Matt Winkler because I just want them there and I like set dressings. Sorry, everybody. Spoiler alert. But yeah, well, this one's a real you thing. Do your best. Um, this this is funny because it, honestly, if I were to pick one that I thought had to be made up, it would be this one because it is so delightfully verbose. Nobody wants it a is. disagreeable and useless toilet. <laughs> no, of course not. And I mean, if you think about it, it's still uh, applicable today. If oh. you just go on a cruise ship and there's like all, there's like 3,000 signs that say don't flush things that aren't designed to go into this toilet. Otherwise, you're going to have a bad cruise. <laughs> One other neat that. thing about about mm-hmm. these toilet stalls is they had this, uh, they got creative and added this interesting little design where if you, if the door was open, the, the light would be off, the little bulb in the stall. But they had the switch in the door frame where when you closed it, uh, the light bulb would turn on. So, you know, you do your business, open the door, goes off again. Right. And this was a detail that was uh, especially noted by, uh, what's the spy from Cunard? What's his oh, name? Oh, Peskett, Leonard Peskett. Yeah, Leonard so Peskett's different... chief designer went aboard Olympic. And uh, one of, it's like like her, like one of her first voyages across the Atlantic to uh, New York. And this was one of his favorite little things that he noted. Right, Kyle? Yeah, he, he loved the little switch. He loved the little automatic bulb. He was like, we need to put this on our ship. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's a very simple invention, right? concept, not even an invention. It's just completing the circuit by just 
having a piece of you know metal hit when the door is closed. So technically, that's a mistake. But you know, that's we want to be bad. able to see inside. That sounds delightfully uh, dangerous. In a bathroom. Like, yeah, the 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 high, relatively high voltage going through the door in a <laughs> wet bathroom. Yeah, especially high voltage in 1911 and 12. Yeah. In a wood door. I imagine it was probably just a switch. The door pressed against the switch when it. Yeah, closed. I know. I know. <laughs> Somebody asked about this little folding seat here. What's this about? That's a toilet seat. What? What's it doing that's there? A, that's, an, that's an extra toilet seat. Look at, wow. Let's go look at the, the, the toilet, and we'll com do a comparison. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so this is not my story. This is a story from Bill Sauter. Uh, these things got scratched up quite a bit, especially from the ladies, because mm. they had a lot of... Um, uh, how do I describe this? Uh, they had a lot of things to take off that would that had like buckles and yeah, like clips, just complicated that lingerie. Would, that, yes, and it would scratch the seats. So one of the things that had to be replaced quite often apparently were toilet seats. So there was always a spare toilet seat in uh, each uh, lavatory. Wow, on the ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so people are balking at the idea of a wood toilet seat. Uh, that, hey, they had those for many, many years. Yeah. It's, you got to take off those rose-colored glasses, guys. Yeah, it's true. It's There are a lot yeah. of things. It was like when we were looking down in the Turkish bath and the swimming pool. And, you know, it's it's just, it is a different era. You just have to kind of adjust your uh, your expectations on on what luxury was back then. Half of the world didn't had probably had never experienced probably three quarters of the world didn't even know what a flushing toilet was i remember reading that stewards had to assist third class passengers because they had no idea how to operate a third class bathroom yeah majority of the world's using a hole or a, if they're lucky a bucket i mean it's you know, it's it is what it is back then yeah gorgeous gorgeous space this is well let's uh let's head mm -hmm. outside and stretch our legs a little bit okay a little promenade Oh, let's go up to the boat deck. Oh, you want to go up the boat deck? Let's do it. I want to go outside yeah. to the promenade. I want to talk about the and sign. We'll, we'll, we'll jump up to the boat deck real quick, and then we'll look through the We'll loop back. We'll loop around. We'll, we'll loop around. We'll, we'll, okay. We'll go, okay. Back, we'll, we'll go down through those stairs by the third oh. funnel. All right. It's fine. It's not like the ship's going anywhere. <laughs> this is It's amazing getting closer to this dome. This must have been a very unique, uh, unique view. Wow. Goodness, sorry, I'm getting distracted. We'll head out uh, this way, past the gym where we went last time. Ooh, mm -hmm. look at those beautiful sun rays coming in. Mm. Gorgeous. God rays. We'd love to see it. While we're waiting for this load, I just want to give a very quick shout out to a very special uh, viewer. My girlfriend lives in Nottingham, England, and uh, she watches every stream that we do. So to Katie, I would just like to say hello. To call her oh out my on gosh, stream in like England. That. What time is it in England right now? She'd be asleep, but she's going to watch oh, okay. this tomorrow morning, and then she's going to know oh, yeah. that a couple hundred people heard me say hi to her on, on a stream. That's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a gorgeous view here. There are so many angles mm -hmm. on on Titanic and the Olympic class that are uh, oh very very. Let's pretty. talk about lifeboats briefly. Uh, I don't know what to actually say about them, but. Uh... Matt, what can we say about lifeboats? Yeah, the thanks for passing the baton to someone who doesn't know what to say about them either. Uh, there were 20 lifeboats on Titanic, and they all got away before the ship sank, except for two which floated off the ship. Uh, they weren't full, and they're very controversial. They're made of wood, and... Uh, they're made yeah. of wood. Uh, uh, they, they can canvas clinker. tops. Yeah, they have canvas tops. Yeah. And let's see, these are, 30, these yeah. are the 30-foot-long uh, lifeboats. <laughs> Uh, this is this is boat seven on the starboard side. It's the first lifeboat to be launched, actually. So here we go. It, it might be a good time to mention sort of the, the the general setup they had, which is that they these davits, the davit designs you see here. Oh God! You, the, you're opening a can they, of worms. I'm actually uh, a little little bit of a can of worms because yeah. you know these davits were designed pretty much especially for the Olympic class because uh, there was a similar Devitt design before that, but it was mm -hmm. kind of 
the bases were about half as wide and they could only kind of swing out. These were designed so they could swing in as well as out so that they could put double rows of lifeboats in. And the reason they did this, they White Star wanted to plan for the future because at the time, lifeboat regulations didn't really require them to have boats for everyone on board because the regulations, as I understand it, were based on tonnage and not the number of people. Sounds stupid, but, you know, since when has uh, that kind of stuff ever made sense? When has but, the laws ever made sense? And uh, so, but the White Star line could kind of, you know, Harlan and Wolf, they could kind of smell that the things would change eventually, sooner or later. So they thought, let's, you know, they went to the Wellen, the company that made the Davits, and they were like, okay, let's see if, you know, please you know, make us, design us a new type of Davit that can swing inboard and take uh, extra lifeboats just in case the law changes and we can we can add more lifeboats for everyone on board in the future. And so that's how these kind of davits got uh, made and added to these ships. Mm -hmm. It's it was there specifically for future expansion if they needed more boats. And uh you know, it's something that they were aware of. Uh why they didn't decide to just add more boats. That's the can of worms, and we're not touching it. Yeah, Wellen did present a plan himself. The designer of these boats did present a plan, essentially his suggestion for a layout of boats, um, making probably full use of his davit. And uh, I forget the exact number. I think that's where the 64 boat number comes from, because it was essentially double rows of boats on both sides of the ship. And uh, that would have been ridiculous for the time, um, because no ship had that many boats it would have seemed yep. you know again yeah it is a can of worms but you just wonder what yep. the if the effect of cluttering your your ship with lifeboats would would give off at a time when that kind of scale of disaster hadn't happened and um well, well you know we'll just say that uh, the only can of worms that i'm going to just very quickly very quickly brush against is that you know obviously when titanic sank she had just enough time to launch the main lifeboats and a couple of the collapsibles before you know the other two were kind of washed off. It's uh, I think a lot of us kind of agree that if she had more boats, it wouldn't have done a ton of good. I mean, you know, maybe some would have floated off the ship, and it would have helped a bit extra. But it's it's hard to say. It's hard or to say. on the counter argument is that people would have assumed they had more time seeing more boats and not have filled them or not have gotten into the boats. There's or the other boats would have gotten in the way, you know, so many variables when you get, in, when you try to think of the, the Titanic, what ifs again, you know, yeah. it's difficult. It's a very difficult can of worms. Like uh, as we've, we're constantly saying back and forth. Well, so let's take this can of worms and throw it over the railing. If Mike, can you throw it over the railing? Go to the railing. And I just can of worms. physically threw it over the railing. One thing that's very uh, evident up here is how broad and spacious this uh this deck is how much room there is how beautiful and open this feels for a ship of this era is quite unique because these ships were cluttered with equipment always um but this is very beautiful very modern yeah there's almost nothing oh, there check really out, go check out the lounge windows uh oh yeah oh, oh actually Head up to the, uh, you can check out the lounge windows, uh, head up to the raised roof as well, and maybe the, uh, that, what's that little platform up there? What's that, what's that platform for? What, what is that? Ah, I don't know. We're not allowed up there. We're passengers. <laughs> we got to follow the rules. Let's mm -hmm. go have a look. Yeah, these are the windows we were talking about earlier, and just in, in through here, you'd see the, uh, those spaces, the lounge, um, and that's where it's getting all that natural light from. It's absolutely gorgeous. But yeah, let's go and have a look at this little, this little interesting platform looking thing. Almost identical to those installed on the Big Four. Although those were, those were installed mm -hmm. just after the bridge. Um, of course, Big Four being Adriatic, Baltic, Baltic, Cedric, and Celtic. The previous generation of extremely large white star liner. What are we standing on and what are we looking at? Well, we're standing on the... The the co the raised cover for that uh, kind of fake dome thing in the lounge that has the big light fixture in it. Um, there were these quick notes that there were these uh, kind of vent trunks that went around 
that oval shaped dome in the lounge and they were vented by this uh, fan that's sitting on top of it uh, on top of the cover and this thing with the stairs is the compass platform and it was i believe it was the compass they used to adjust all the other compasses by because it was in the center of the ship i thought so and mm -hmm. elevated away from a lot of the steel and stuff so you know they would just they would look at that compass and they'd be like okay we need to adjust all of ours uh, the others according to this and that's what they did and they they were checked daily as i understand i think there was uh, was it a total of 4 compass binnacles on titanic Yes. Quick count on top of my head. Two forward, one middle, one aft. Yeah. Right? Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. And this being the most accurate, being away from the steel decking, um, is getting the center. least magnetic yep. interference. Uh, but what a view, huh? Mm -hmm. Sandwiched between these two massive mm -hmm. funnels. I now you're in the center of the world. Yeah, so that's an interesting Jack. one. This is essentially the... Um, almost the exact center of the of the ship um as marked on the hull there was actually a little marking that they they painted um so they put it exactly amidships and basically as far away from the funnels as you could get uh perfectly in between two, two of the two of them to avoid that magnetic interference right yep you're almost center yeah just on the staircase now you're center right there that's, yeah that's frame one f right there and that's the right, this is it one f yeah frame one f is the center line or the midships line, whatever. Brilliant. I love, um, I, I do love this little structure purely for the fact that there's all these great photographs of Olympic in the 20s and 30s. And you think of, we think of this stuff as like such a, as researchers and, and buffin, you know, boffins, sorry, and nerds and things. Like we think of these as, you know, very technically what it's for or all that. But there are pictures of kids kind of like swinging off this like it's a jungle gym. It, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, there are countless photos of people just hanging on these stairs on the railings. Yeah, I've seen like I've seen like the Boy Scouts on it, or the acrobats <laughs> doing like climbing up the guy wires and everything. People had a lot of fun on Olympic, and this isn't just in the twenties. This is also like um, around Maiden Voyage, nineteen eleven. We went back when we were thinking that you know the Edwardian era was this stuffy like. Uh, era where people were just walking around with corsets and you know just looking at each other and being going aghast if anyone did anything out of line they they were still people you know sitting on the deck and, you know uh, yeah they like, had they had literally fun. on the deck talking to each other like enjoying life they they had fun they smiled they took goofy pictures and uh, yeah. yeah a lot of group photos on top of that dome too one, so my, my, one of my favorite uh, pictures from the oh sorry i was just going to say that just on that point one of my favorite pictures was just here on on olympic just on this little bit of deck and uh it was in summer i think of 1911 maybe for a was her maiden voyage and it's a mm -hmm. i think it's an egg and spoon race oh yeah i was just thinking about the the sporting events yeah and yep. um what's interesting because we're kind of going through this at the moment we're working on our own game called grand voyage that's kind of similar you explore these spaces we're gonna have people dressed in costume and we th again you you know like maybe the movie is a little bit to blame for this but you think of it as so stuffy mm -hmm. and so formal and in the film they're all beautifully dressed but um a weird thing at sea a, a weird tweak to the rules but yeah there were very strict rules about the way you would dress but on liners people relax the way that they dress and there's pictures yep. of people doing these activities the men are wearing flat caps in first class and white trousers and they're kind of in the equivalent of like their sportswear and people are just relaxed and and they would kind of tone it down a little bit. You would never really see men wearing formal day wear, uh, morning dress at sea. It was usually a nope. lot more relaxed. At nighttime for dinner was when they would um, go to, to their white tie. But photographs of people just relaxing and kind of playing games and things. They're all dressed very relaxedly in first class. But unfortunately... Showing people as kind of down to earth and cool and relaxed doesn't really play into the narrative of first class being the elite snobby kind of, you know. So it, it didn't really fly in the movie. But in real life, you're shocked to see people in first class kind of looking and acting like like normal people. <laughs> yeah. The shame that Titanic didn't reach her summer days to have a sporting events like Olympic did. You know, they didn't have any of the, of, of the fun 
I guess. Yeah. That Olympic was able to enjoy for many of the years. You know, there's a lot of uh, things like that where you can say it's a shame the Titanic X didn't do this or that. But you know, that's just one of them. The 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 pillow sack or uh, the pillow even you know, like the children on the the oars uh, sporting events. I'm not even sure which one that's called. Uh, there's the, the egg the egg race that you said, Mike. Mm. Um, there's a bunch of those games that they did. You know, I, I have a sporting events uh, list uh, printed on Olympic, and there's games I've never even heard of. You know, it, it's just it's something that you can just envision them doing. But you know, the very first thing you go to is you think of them doing it uh, dressed up with their to the nines. Yeah. And you, th- and you know, you think like, what? They can't do this. They can't have any fun. But no, nope, they're doing it. Keep it with people. They're uh, they're normal people. people. They're relaxing, and no one's watching them really. Yeah. Speaking of relaxing, uh, why don't we go down to the promenade? How Wonderful. do we get there? Yeah. So here's another little uh, shock that people might get: is that the promenade for first class did not wrap around the entirety of boat deck. It ends right here. This is where the engineers can hang out. Um, and though there is second class, believe it or not. So we're gonna head I, on down. I second class. Because if I'm remembering correctly, there should be a little stairway right here. There's a stairway. Oh, look at that. Doop, 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 Unfortunately, doop, doop. none of this exists anymore because this is basically where Titanic absolutely Snapped. broke apart. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, gentlemen, where are we headed? Or maybe do a loop de loop around the promenade. Yeah, let's have a little look look around. What have we got in here? This is the lounge. Mm-hmm. We won't disturb any of the folks relaxing. We'll go up and see no. that sign that Matt was talking about. I hope it's there. It'd be very awkward if it's not. I know it's there in Britannic. I know the one you mean. <laughs> yeah, it's there in Britannic, patrons of the Mediterranean. Okay, uh let's pretend it's there. Let's just let's just go fast. Oh no, there she is. Look. Right there. Oh no, it's there, thank goodness. Okay, there it is. It's there. Okay. I know we took it from Britannic, so yeah. Ah, uh, thank you, Derek. Yeah. Well not well, pass forward in the sign. You put the sign there. I don't I yeah. You, you must have put it there. When I, I put the sign there, I think. Okay, thank you, Kyle. I don't know who to thank anymore. It's one of you guys. Well, there's nowhere else on uh, A deck has these staterooms. Um mm-hmm. And so this is all accommodation. And so they're basically saying, hey, please keep it down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Please don't run around the deck before, you know, like 9 a.m. Because that's going to piss off the, the rich people. Um, something I've noticed. Back then, deck chairs. Dun, dun. Well, actually, yeah. Well, let's talk about this. The numbers listed dun, dun. here on, uh, on the rails. Dun, dun. What's all that about? Dun, 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 dun. Uh, well, well, I mean, obviously these numbers would be from like one to like, uh, I don't know how many deck chairs there were here. A lot, hundreds. Well, I mean, <clears> yesterday, <throat> the other day was Friday the 13th. Yeah, so, and, and the thing is, they like to, of course, they were scared at a number 13. Humans are weird <laughs> like that. And so they would avoid the number 13 on a lot of stuff, including deck chairs. There was no 13th deck chair, as far as I know. There I mean, was right, a 13th yeah. lifeboat, uh, mm-hmm. which, you know, would be get confusing if you didn't have that, which almost got crushed, incidentally. So, you know, maybe they were on the or Maybe like they're that. right, yeah. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> you, you're, you're, but the numbers you're at right there, you should be looking at, like, the six, like the 70s, 68, 70, 72. So yeah, yeah. But, and uh, that, that old saying yeah, "rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic" is stupid <laughs> mm-hmm. because the deck chairs were very yeah, neatly yeah. arranged. Yeah, they, 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 they were very they were very arranged. There and, was a system. Know, I just made them all thirteen to make fun of the fact that there was no thirteen. <laughs> I mean, there is there is one thirteen and two thirteen, and three and three thirteen and four fifteen and and five thirteen. That's a great Easter egg. thirteen. Oh, oh no, I think you just figured out why Titanic sank. Oh. <laughs> They use thirteen, but it's it's when it's it when there's a leading number in front of it, it doesn't matter. But when it's thirteen by itself, they don't they don't give a they don't give a darn. So the reason I mean, for this they, is really so yeah. interesting, and again, it's just one of those things. Nowadays, you go on a ship, you can just go and plop yourself down on a deck chair. And I've heard from mm-hmm. friends that uh, for some reason, especially German cruise passengers, are very good at uh, reserving <laughs> deck chairs early in the morning, um, are they? which is quite funny. But um, back then. First day on board, you would uh, step aboard in first class, go and visit the person, make sure you had 
uh, everything set up, dinner, you had your table, you would reserve and pay for a deck chair. And that would be your deck chair for the voyage. And so you had to have the number. And number you, you wanted. Yep. This go is find especially it. important. Yeah. Very interesting little bit of uh, operational history. You know, you've obviously become very good friends with the purser. Um, you'd probably want a good deck chair. Yeah. Quick question. Hey, let's do a quick thing here. Somebody start counting. Hold on. I'm going to do it. Hold on. Let me, let me do something. I'm going to start a timer. I want to see if you're, if you press, if you're doing a run, if you're holding the run key and you go around the promenade, I want to see how long it takes you to, uh, to run around the promenade. You ready, Mike? The whole promenade deck? Yep. Go around the whole promenade. Let's see how long that takes. Okay. Three, two, get re one. Get ready. Yep. Set. Go. All right, we are now. Possible. You should have a stamina bar. Like he runs out of stamina after a while. <laughs> yeah, I hate those in games so much. In um, on Queen Mary too, it's interesting. They do have it marked how far around the promenade deck it is if you're walking um, and doing loops. I forget exactly oh. what the number is, but four loops is the equivalent of a mile, I think, off the top of my head. Olympic eventually got one of those plaques. Mm -hmm. Another thing which I wish Titanic had, but you know. Because I like set dressings, but yeah, I uh, I went to the gym this morning, uh, not to show off or anything, and already Man. doing this right now is making me uh, give me flashbacks to to doing my cardio. <laughs> I'm already tired. We'll come back around. A beautiful, there, open, Kyle. uninterrupted uh, space. This is just gorgeous. Uh, get get to that doorway. Hurry up. This is there. this is actually taking longer than I thought it would. Yeah. Going about a mile around this boat. Come down. on, Mike. Let's go. You could do this it. This is a this is a pretty fast run speed too. Oh gosh, you know I used to run a 5k every other day. This is bringing back flashbacks too. Made it. One minute and ten seconds approximately. Wait, seriously? That was a minute? Yep. Oh my gosh. Okay. It's a big deck. Uh, she's what just shy of 900 feet long overall. The promenade deck would be. What we're taking off about 150 feet at either end, so it's still a bit, I, that promenade itself this. would be as long as some of the larger ocean liners of the day, from from tip to tip. I have to measure this. I'm going to measure this using my deck plans right now. I don't believe any of this. This is ridiculous. One of um, we were just talking then about the the wind, and on later liners they would have screens erected, essentially running the entire length of the the promenade and and boat decks. Promenade decks were enclosed, but boat decks like the United States had shields coming out that looked a little bit like Titanic's breakwater running along the boat deck to shield people from the wind because Titanic's moving at twenty odd knots, you know, forty k's an hour. I don't know what that is in miles. I'm sorry, I don't use freedom units. Um, and so. Mm -hmm you know coupled with a, a you know a headwind you've got like crazy gusts and so having these screens here really really helps in reducing what would essentially be uncontrolled wind ripping up and down the boat deck and just making or the promenade deck and making life miserable i'm still here i'm just doing math no no, no go right ahead yeah this is a beautiful view and so oh why don't why don't we head aft to the, uh, I believe there's a door on the promenade to the aft grand staircase and then maybe head into that smoke room and the, uh, oh, we could, oh, we could go aft and then go in through the, uh, palm courts. Brilliant. Another oh, interesting yeah. thing here, the screens for, uh, the A-deck promenade were kind of, uh, a semi last minute addition, um, to Titanic, but you can see the, uh, the effect that it has. This is like a, a nice, comfortable, enclosed space for first class uh, to relax and promenade and sit down in. That's like 2,100 feet. So we're just around 2,100 you, uh, feet in a minute. calculating our velocity? No, I was, I was calculating the distance. Well, okay, now, okay if it was 2,100 feet and it took him... <laughs> it, wait, Mike just ran 2,100 feet and it took him a, one minute and 10 seconds... <laughs> How fast did Mike run around the Titanic's A deck? Well, uh, and your, the important question is how long would it take a swallow to fly around the promenade? <laughs> and when would they reach New York? And would they There's reach? a stained glass from the smoke room. It's lovely. It's interesting as well that this room in particular has stained glass 
uh, that obscures essentially vision into the room because it's mm-hmm. it's made in the style of the London Club, the gentlemen's club that is admissible only to gentlemen. That is where you know you had some of the very big harsh. power players of the day, and it's very private. And they still exist. There's still quite a few of them in London. The Garrick Club, the Savage Club. There's quite a few of them, and very private. And it's interesting that again on Titanic, they're they're trying to recreate that atmosphere. Um, of, of privacy, you you can't look in. So let's step on into the aft grand staircase here and have a little look. I'm keeping an eye on the um, on the comments. Someone, uh, Wild Smiley, has asked: Were you referring to a European or an African swallow? <laughs> I don't Which know one? that. Okay. <laughs> Everyone's quoting Monty Python with extreme prejudice. Hmm. <laughs> um. Sean Thabor Jr. I probably got your name wrong. Sorry. Says, uh, can you get up the bridge in captain's quarters? This is a uh, first class tour only. We will be continuing this as a series, working our way down the classes. Um, if you guys want us to do it sequentially, we can do second class next, third class, and then machinery spaces and, and crew. Uh, let us know in the comments of this. If you want us to do crew next, we can do that. We can check out the engine rooms and the boilers. Um, but I, I, in my mind, I imagine going first, second, third crew spaces but let me know what you guys think brilliant so we've walked on in oh if we're Uh a man where do we go now let's go and have a look told you guys earlier it's not it's not set in stone that it was men only on titanic but yeah (laughs) i believe renee uh renee harris went into the smoke room to, to see her husband where there's smoke there's fire mm-hmm. i know where that's from I, I, I mean plus you also had to consider that you know how else would women get into the the, the veranda and palm courts i mean the, the revolving it's doors true. over there you can't expect you to, to go outside through. but no i have seen i'm researching titanic i got research a bunch of other ships and i have seen uh photographs of uh ships of the era with like I said before, with signs next to the doors entering the smoke room that says the smoking lounge is reserved for gentlemen only. Big letters. So uh, that this, this discrimination was was apparent. Yeah, it was expected in the in the teens in the twenties on certain liners. So oh, yeah. uh, mm. Check out the painting over the fireplace. A quick oh, word yeah. about that. <clears throat> God, I mean, this is just gorgeous. I, this looks so comfortable. Anyway, yes. Yeah. So this uh, this painting was, I believe, it was uh, Plymouth Harbor. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. Yeah. yeah. And um, it was painted by a guy named Norman Wilkinson, and he did the uh, painting approach for the New World in this same place on Olympic. Anyway, because Titanic sank, we, you know, the painting was lost. But years later, uh, Wilkinson's son found his. Uh, his father's notes that he did for for this painting, like sketches and stuff. So he was able to see what the painting probably looked like, and he did a recreation of it. So I believe that's what this painting is here. That's the recreation. So we at least have an idea of what it looked like on Titanic. And uh, incidentally, Wilkinson is also the guy who was approached for designing the famous Dazzle paint scheme that we see on a lot of World War I ships, including Olympic. As Al. Yeah, his uh, second uh, Olympic connection there. Mm-hmm. What are these uh, little chests here? This this is the, um, as I understand it, the only functional fireplace in first class spaces on Titanic. Is that right? Correct. Yes. So what, what did they burn here at this fireplace? Well, I'm going to say money? it wasn't wood. They money. It wasn't they burned wood. money. It's, it's, it's true. The ship burnt money. So. Uh, uh, she yes, would have been but, coal, I assume. Coal, yes. Okay. So where do they store the coal? I'm going to say in here. Yes, sir. Those are two little coal boxes on either side of the fireplace. So what obviously was... when passengers are, um, probably when the ship's in port and getting ready for voyages, these coal boxes are make sure to be filled up uh, for the voyages. So yeah, these are coal boxes on either side of the fireplace here. And um, in, in the past... toot my horn a little bit and say that I'm really happy with 
the the fire effect that I did on this. It's uh, indeed very pretty. It's su it's smoldering fire. It's like a it coal. Is. You know, it's perfect. Yeah, yeah. It oh, makes it feel very cozy. Uh, these these uh, in these interior uh, stained glass windows are interesting too. I know there's one photo where you can just kind of see a lit bulb behind the those windows next to the fireplace. Yeah, that lighting and, effect right there is pretty perfect. Mm. Yeah, exactly what we see. Uh, what do you suppose is through those revolving doors? The ones that Jack and Rose went through, the ones that made the whoosh sound. Oh yeah, I we got to get the whoosh. sound effects ready again. It's um, okay. I'll do it. As always, I was just going to say, White Star Line, kind of, uh, sorry, uh, Harlan and Wolf really working with what they've got. Uh, this is the, the the trunking for the fourth funnel. And, um, is, or is, is it this one? That, is that number three? That's number three, isn't it? That's number four. That's the turbine engine casing right there. Yeah. You're oh, correct. yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Um, and so that you've got trunking leading down and it's, you know, what, what do you do with that space? Unfortunately, you're going to have a, a, a big block in the middle of your room and trust Harlan Wolf to turn it into a, essentially like a beautiful ornate display piece by covering it in in lit stained glass windows to again kind of trick yeah, people and, into and thinking. they weren't they weren't just lit there were also these uh there was space behind those windows like a big wraparound kind of u-shaped trunk that went up to the boat deck in the fourth funnel housing above and then there were windows on the boat deck in that area and it would let in natural light that would come down the trunks through these windows so they really took advantage to make sure that as much light as possible got into this room yeah yeah you can see if you sort of look at it from the right angle at near the corner like where you are you can kind of see there's one uh, yeah. some light up through through there yeah you can just make it gorgeous sorry some of our paint some of our stained glass is still blank Oh, the head over to that 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 before we head uh through the doors to that area to the right of the doors. So the, first of all, yeah, to, first of all, we have like a display case for like all the tobacco products and other things that you would I imagine you would be able to buy uh, over there. And then there's a board on the wall. Uh, as I understand it, um, betting on the ship's runs was a pretty big thing back in those days like how many miles is the ship is the ship going to go today how many did it make and people bet on that a lot didn't they mm -hmm. yeah they had to do something to stay occupied instead you guys get to look at a project 401 poster that's great though yeah I'll, yeah in real life they would probably post up like uh papers saying yeah the ship went this far today we made this many miles and yeah. so on boring notices even the weather such <laughs> things are, such as that well, nothing changes because now there's uh, shipboard you know newsletters and things that get dropped off mm -hmm. every morning with that kind of information and people still take active interest in where they're heading and how far they've gone and Indeed, it's funny yep. what has remained you know it, it's it's funny when people get angry uh at, when others call Titanic a cruise ship, and essentially she is just the predecessor. When, as many things have not changed, it's just evolved slightly. Yeah. Although one oh. thing you won't see scattered around now is spittoons. That's true. You know, you won't see that. Yeah. Thank oh my goodness. Look behind you. Look, 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 let's take a peek through that window. It's technically a crew area, but what, what's? Oh yeah. Looks like yeah, someone yeah. Walked in open. What's in there? What is that? Look at that. I can uh, see outside the ship from there. And now here's a fun little thing. If you ever see someone talk about bars on Titanic, oh yeah, the first first class bar, lounge bar, smoke room bar, this is what they mean. Titanic didn't, well, I mean, it didn't literally have like, you know, a cheers bar where everyone sat around. The bars were name. just pantries where they had this stuff in their equipment, a fridge, a, a thing, you know, a counter. And that's just where the, the bar is just where the drinks were prepared and crew would carry it out from there. That, yeah, it, really. when the ships actually incorporated something like that, they would, uh, well, the British ships anyway, they would literally call them on their deck plans American Bar. And the Titanic and Olympic did not have anything akin to that whatsoever. Yeah. It's like a serving, it's just a serving space. space. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Jinx, exactly. So you would have had stewards, of course, rushing things around, bringing out All brandy, over the place, cigars. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. yeah. Amazing. Just see order. John Jacob Astor sitting yeah. over there in that couch. 
Mm -hmm. Hey, Matt, get, get, your, get your swishing sound right. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hang on. Lick my lips. Mm -hmm. Which oh, lips? Wait. <laughs> that door needs some oil. It okay. never gets old. Um, it so, looks like the door is already covered in oil. Oh, okay. This one's interesting because you've got the veranda cafe and the palm court cafe, which are almost identical, but one becomes popular with women and children, especially. Mm -hmm. And I understand it's not this one. It's not this one, no. Because of the smoke. <laughs> Essentially, yeah, it's the one that's pretty isolated uh, on the on the starboard side, and so it's the one that is the the smoking one, the one that where you can smoke in, which is where you are now. That is popular because smoking was a big deal back then. You know, more people smoked, and it's it's this one where everyone would want to go to. Also, this was the more popular one. This is the more popular one, yeah. Ah, interesting. Mm -hmm. It's it's funny though. Um, this part of the ship is quite amusing to me because again, there's photographs of children playing out here a lot, and on Olympic they installed a swing on this awning rafter that ran to the mm -hmm. to the mast, um, and it's almost like it reminds me of daycare now, where parents will sit around having a coffee, watching their kids play. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it could be. Mm -hmm. Um, this was an interesting one. Where did of course, later on in line of history, you get winter gardens, um, which are vaguely kind of similar to this concept. Where did the whole, uh, was, was this a new thing for White Star Line and Highland and Wolf or have they been kind of building these on liners in the, in the lead up to Titanic and Olympic? Well, you have a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's something that comes along from, uh, you know, in the, what's popular in Edwardian style, um, which ship had it first? Uh, the German liners had an, an idea of it. Lusitania and Mauritania have their version of an open air. Uh, it was a, it's called a veranda cafe, not a winter garden, right? On the aft end of of their uh, promenade deck. I don't know Lusitania and Mauritania that well, but it's essentially the same kind of space. On the that's it's completely open, I believe, on both the, those sister ships. Um, and th this is the first introduction of something this size on, on, for Harlan Wolf in White Star, and you know this is, that this is a direct almost copy of Palm Courts um, taken from hotels. Again, like the design choices that they've made are inspired from what is popular of the day, and you can see the the. The trellis patterns and the window pet designs from uh, the, the hotels in New York and in London just taken almost like off the walls and brought on board these ships, which is what their their efforts to make it make these spaces fashionable and popular. Unlike which is ironic because then they have certain rooms in certain spaces which are almost old-fashioned and archaic mm, yeah. which they would find out um pretty quickly uh with britannic that they needed to do some changes with and a lot of those today we think that's just ridiculous and like because we we kind of have a desire for the the old-fashioned but a lot of britannic's uh, staterooms and styles they were kind of toning down on because it was just almost out of fashion as soon as Britannic was going to like get into service, but of course the war ended all that. Mm. Um, this is where we have to when we're, when we're creating spaces for Titanic on and Glory still, and for instance, when we look at the the staterooms for Titanic, we have to think: is there did they already start to tone back some of the intricate uh, design choices like they did for Britannic? Um, and so there is some evidence for that. And one of the design choices I keep, I'm, I'm kind of talking about is, for instance, the the gilding and the guild work on Britannic. It seems that they would they still carved out intricate wood patterns into mahogany and oak for a lot of her cabins, but they decided to not add any um, gilding, no no, go, no gold essentially on the carvings, which they did for Olympic, made famous in. Uh, 
the the sitting rooms, like the, the Strauss cabin, for instance. Mm. And in Titanic's wreck, uh, I think we talked. Did we visit uh, the sitting room before in the first? Uh, no, we before? haven't been I think to we the sitting rooms yet. No, okay, but yeah, I don't want to spoil it. But yeah, but on Titanic sitting in in the wreck of Titanic, there's a there's in some areas which still exist to this day, or back, at least 2005 when it was explored, there is gilding visible, but in certain areas, it's not there. And it's it's a debate that that gilding just disappear, or was it just intentionally never applied for Titanic? Mm. So she could have been, is Titanic the happy medium between Olympic and Britannic again? It's a lot of mysteries that we have um, for Titanic, and there always will be. Yeah, you have to make some educated um, decisions mm-hmm. at certain points to, to you know bring it to life. And, or just know. paint the entire ship cream. <laughs> We're not talking about what color white. <laughs> nope. Uh, what color white remember. was used. I was going to go over to that yep. other, um, the other side here. Mike, yeah. we could have walked through the bar. Oh, we could have just gone back Michael. into the smoking room and gone in. Yep. Michael, it's Mike, a- Michael, Michael Brady. It's okay. We get we, to go back outside. We can just look That's in through true. the windows here. Plus, we get to. Uh, we get, it's uh, you fine. Know, we, when you go back through the doors again, you can watch up swoosh again. You know what? You can go back in through this side and go take a look in the smoke room bar. We won't tell anyone. It's a crew area. It but is we a crew can area. Go in there. All right. Well, you um, do whatever he wants. I do. What I do like about this kind of stepped promenade uh, end here for first class is that th- this looks down onto third class. But what's hilarious is that's the second class <laughs> promenade up there. So it's oh, like first class is the focal point. Person. So much, didn't it? <laughs> Bothers me right now. They hated it. They hated it. Yeah. It's I, amazing. It's amazing. I love it. You, you love to see it. It doesn't work cinematically, uh, cinematically either. <laughs> There's a line in like SOS Titanic where I think she's like... <laughs> They want to be where we are, and we don't want to be where they are. Mm. Like, we're here in the middle or something. And like, wait a minute, that doesn't work, because second class should be, like, right there. It goes second, first, second, third. Mm. Yeah, of course, here's the second class entrance down into the... No, we need to have first class up there, then second class, then third class, and then (laughs) fourth class, because it's the United States line. (laughs) I do. Uh, I always point this out when I get to this area. This is my favorite thing ever. There's this brilliant bit of video of Olympic, I think, in the 20s, uh, where there is this ladder where if you're a crewman and you're up on the boat deck and you need to get down to A deck, you could just swing your leg over and just go down that ladder. But um, some guy figured out that you, it was way easier to just step over, grab that cable on the crane, step down the crane, and jump mm-hmm. onto the deck. <laughs> Look, they just, it's, it's like the, it's like grass lines where there's pathways but people take but you can see where the grass has been like completely like yeah walked upon like you know the designers had something intent in mind but but human humans know what uh the, the easiest way to get from point a to point b is well that's a nice little preview of the uh the promenade the private promenade that we might be heading towards one day one day we might, have, actually, we might have run out of time today, which is shocking because we usually are so good at sticking within the the allocated timing budget, you know? I don't know if that was sarcasm. <laughs> no, no. I've never been sarcastic in my life. Nope. Um, so this is the non-smoking. Uh, well, we'll get there in a sec, but this is the non-smoking mm-hmm. uh, cafe. The other the the starboard side veranda and palm court slash children's playroom possibly at least on Olympic maybe Titanic. Man, yeah. I'm looking forward to I, I, one thing I'm looking forward to, even though it's kind of a boring space, is seeing the squash court in part thirty-seven of Ocean Liner Designs THD tour. <laughs> we'll get there one day. No, it won't be part thirty-seven. It'll be part thirty-five. We'll do well. <laughs> um. Interesting that they've chosen to use the tiles that you would have seen. Are these are these identical to the ones in the pool? They are, yes. Oh. Everyone calls them the the pool tiles, but they're, they're in bathrooms used everywhere. And, yeah, and they're used on like other ships too. So buyer beware. No, they're 
I've seen, you know, they they were used in the Harlan and Wolf's uh, offices in Belfast. Uh, they're quite popular, quite robust. On a wider note, I don't think we talk enough. Well, we have talked, but we don't talk enough about just how much of a copy paste job a lot of this stuff is on these ships. Like we looked at the lounge earlier, and it, it, we may have noted it before, but it's worth noting again that there were there's a, there was at least one other ship. I think it was Oceanic. That mm -hmm. literally just her her lounge was exactly the same design, the same carvings, paneling, everything. It was the same, and there are other ships too, a little bit smaller. Yeah, yeah, a little smaller, but like the same overall style. And well, that... there were other ships that had similar things too, like the same floor tiles, the same. You know, there was a ship that had like I think the same dining saloon tiles that titanic had and there was a ship that had the same chairs that were in titanic's dining saloon and you just see this a lot mm. in a lot of these ships yeah Those like the, 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 the few unique there are a few unique features to titanic olympic and britannic but more or less they just eventually evolved the ships bigger 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 with the same uh interior features and uh i like to say that it's just what we do today with cruise ships. Or sorry, I calling Titanic a cruise ship again, but you know they they be, they a company uh, creates a cruise ship. It does. They see what does well on the cruise ship, which uh, nightclubs, which dining options is are successful, and they say, okay, we want to make more money. We want to make something bigger. We'll increase the size of the cruise ship. We'll increase the size of the nightclubs. We'll increase the size of the dining room. But we want to keep some things the same because we know it does well. So they look mm -hmm. at the older model and they just they expand upon it and they add maybe a little bit of a new feature. That's what they did with Titanic. They looked at Oceanic, the, the liner of the century, and said, well, okay, let's take the best from Oceanic and, and expand upon it. Oceanic it becomes Olympic class. The lounge mm -hmm. from Oceanic is becomes the lounge of olympic and titanic um uh, fellas sorry excuse me for a minute i think someone's knocking at my door um hopefully it's not someone stream sniping me do you mind um i'm just going to go and check that out but do you mind just running through what's what we're kind of looking at here we've got a telephone sure. and some interesting looking thing oh, well, i'll just be right back yes one moment oh before hopefully. we uh before we talk about that i think someone asked what this is again this is uh, a bar this is uh, Titanic Project for well, it's Titanic Demo 401, and it, yeah, it, let's it, be very clear about that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's uh, essentially a demo for uh, the upcoming Project 401, which I'm I'm not going to get to here. But this, what you see here, this is a demo. This is free. It contains roughly a little less, I think, than 50 percent of the Titanic explorable in terms of deck space in, inside and out, uh, and you can explore half the ship in here all the fun uh, parts of titanic yeah uh, the fun parts all pretty almost all the public rooms except i think the one room in second class barbershop and uh, you know a, a good selection of cabins a bunch of uh corridors and uh yeah you know, just other stuff and you can go on our website at titanic hg.com and you can if you go i think it is uh to the project for a one page Yes, there's a uh, at the top. There is a set of downloads for this demo. You can download it for free. You can explore half of Titanic for free. Uh, what we're showing in this video here. Now, what's what are we looking at here in this bar? At well, there's a lot of um, somewhat archaic versions of things we have today in this bar, and some familiar things. That we have. Oh, hopefully that's Mike. I'm back. But yeah. Oh, thank goodness. It was a white star line official telling me off for entering a crew space. <laughs> oh, all right. I'm I'm waiting for the day where White Star Line comes and it delivers <laughs> me a cease and desist. But that day hasn't arrived yet. So let's let's get out of there because we're not allowed there. Anymore. Yeah, no, that's, that's just sorry. for first class. Sorry. And sorry. the safe's open. The safe is open. Oh, I didn't my crack that safe. No. Can't be done. I mean, I mean, they make a lot of oh. revenue in that bar. Why you know, don't we go down? These drinks aren't I was cheap. Gonna, I was going to mention, we talked about the spaces on Titanic that aren't completely unique. 
But um, yeah, uh, let's head down, let's head down to the restaurants because uh, no, there we're going through two spaces here. One, I think, one of the most unique spaces on the ship was the grand staircase. I would it's imagine because I haven't I haven't seen anything like these stairs on any other ship ever, uh, except for Titanic and Olympic, and you know, I guess eventually Britannic if that had. I'll ruin uh, it for you. Well, the dome is on other ships. Yeah, the, you see domes on other ships, but this type of paneling, these type of like just the design you see here, you just don't see that exact thing on no, the yeah. ships. Very unique. I, I think the, I think the Elecart restaurant, which you can just head over to now, I guess, and also the cafe. Um, I think the restaurant is also a space. And would I be correct, Matt, in saying that that's also pretty unique because it's I, I unique. Have not... I, it's uh, yeah, it was the first, for, I believe. Uh, someone's gonna prove me wrong for the White Star Line. Um, not the not the first restaurant at sea, I believe. Like uh, a paying well, option at sea. Uh, well, not just that, but like the de the, the decor of the room. The oh yeah, the decor too. Uh, well, yeah, uh, to a, to a degree, yes. Um, there was this the portions of the design of the room, the paneling has been used on other ships, kind of prior, painted in a different way. So, uh, you know they. A lot of these, a lot of spaces. Well, that window looks, that mirror looks bizarre. A lot of these spaces are uh, Harlan and Wolf. You know, it is recycling, but just like tweaking something of of the design of a certain space to make it look um, a different way. Which is, it, it's it's kind of impressive what they do, really. Uh, and yeah. uh, you know, that's what you get to create a space like this. In the case of the restaurant, well, first of all, this is a quick thing. That thing at the front of the room is not a bar. It's uh, not a bar, no. It's a buffet. It's a buffet. But not a buffet as in, come on, kids. Let's get dressed. We're going out to Old Country Buffet. And after church, we're hungry. That's not what a buffet is. In the sense of the word. A buffet back then is just a display bar, and there'd be it'd be basically you'd, you'd there would be, food items could be put there. It's more like a sideboard area. Um, the food I've I've seen photographs of this this entire like display um, on other ships of, of a similar room with uh, um, confectionaries, uh, and you know that they they made. Uh, for events and such placed uh, on here for display, you know, to show, to show off the skills of the bakers and the, you know, we'd have racks of uh, meats and everything. But it's not a buffet where you'd walk up and make your, your, your take your food selections like you're on board a cruise ship today. So um, the name is um, a little bit um, yeah. uh, of a disingenuous to what the, the common uh, viewer might think of today again. Now, th this room, as you mentioned, this room is kind of unique in the sense of, like, the kind of room it was, what it, the purpose it served, which was that, you know, the, uh, usually on ships you had your dining saloons, you know, first, mm -hmm. second, third class, and you went in there, you had your, like, uh, you know, your your seating. Was it was it assigned or not in the, the saloons? I, uh, the, the saloons, yes. The, the, the main dining saloons, dinner was assigned, lunch and breakfast was not assigned. Yeah. So, so, yeah. You know, you 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 go into these saloons. You take your meals. You have to order what they have on the menu on the menu for that particular night, uh, as I understand it. Like, if they're serving, I don't know, what, what's a common dish they would serve in the saloon, first class? Uh, filet mignon. The, the, the beef. I was gonna say just beef. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if they were serving oh. beef. You'd have mm -hmm. to eat the beef. Let's eat much. the beef. Right. The beef. Uh, no, you have you have, the... you have several options, but yeah, you know, yeah, you don't get the full menu. Yeah, yeah, not not a lot, and uh, it was included in your ticket as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you ate in the saloon, is inclu included in your ticket, but you didn't really have many options in the Alacart restaurant. You had more freedom to order from a wider menu of uh, the Ritz, stuff. Yes, right. Alacart, Alacart, meaning yeah. like on the side. I'm yeah. gonna order. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you, you could come here. You could take your meals. Um, at more, uh, more options at any time, as I understand it, because that's the other thing with the dining saloons is that there were set times to go and eat these meals. Right. And here you could come up anytime you wanted and when it was open. And uh, yeah, and you'd have to pay for it here. You'd have you, you paid did, for yes. your food if you came up here. It was uh, you know, it was basically it's just it's a Ritz. It's a fancy, fancy restaurant on the ship, and it was ran pretty much as a separate business by a separate staff. Uh, and yeah, it was a contract. Yeah, they had its own kitchen, its own galley, and its own restaurant manager, Gotti. And um, <clears throat> it's yeah, it was its own business. And apparently, if you took all of your meals in here exclusively on the trip, you'd get part of the refund. You get your ticket partially refunded. Mm -hmm. It's a funny one, though, the status of um, Gotti and his staff being some of the you know, greatest restaurateurs and chefs of their time. Uh, because it was a contract and it was run entirely by this external, I think they're all taken from the Ritz Carlton, right? They, they, it's like a contract that served. These guys mm -hmm. are taken out of one of the best hotel restaurants in the world. They were neither crew because they weren't white starlight employees and they weren't passengers, uh, which meant that on the night of the sinking, they died to a man because they didn't fit into either of those categories and they essentially stood aside. And while that disaster was playing out around them, um, unfortunately, you know, not, none of them kind of made it, which is pretty shocking and a very unfortunate position to be in for them because, yeah, they, they just weren't... They straddled both worlds of crew and passenger. Um, so I, I like... My favourite part of this room is this little um, concierge uh, or maitre d's stand here where we've, we've got Friday the 12th of April and we've got names written in the book there. Um, it just pays some small tribute to, I think, the staff that would have stood here and greeted people at the desk and probably been very, very proud of their um, of their restaurant, you know? Don't get used to it. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm moving that desk. You're moving the desk? I'm moving the desk. Spoiler alert. You're moving the desk? Yeah. You're moving the desk? Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, it's on my list, Derek. Interesting. Uh, Another interesting one, actually, about this room is that uh, my understanding is Olympic got a uh, an a la carte restaurant after Titanic's uh, loss, but that the B deck promenades straddled either side of it, and um, they ended up uh, expanding, kind of like Titanic here, right? They ended up actually expanding the restaurant because it was so popular on Olympic. Well, Olympic, yeah, I mean, Olympic already had the restaurant. Uh, before Titanic, of course, and on Titanic it was so popular that they expanded the restaurant. Oh yeah, I that's don't... what I'm thinking. They they kind of like moved it moved it out, made it a bigger space, and then Olympic ended up. Did she follow suit? Did she get the expansion like that? I don't. I it don't did. think Matt. Uh, she did. Yeah. Interesting. Oh yeah, that's right. Because Olympic mm -hmm. got the uh, the cafe and uh, everything. So yeah. Yeah, it's right after in 1913. Sorry, I'm eating a cracker. But I mean, yeah, McDonald's fries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Olympic uh, Olympics restaurant expanded first, um, it, uh, before Titanic um, made voyage, uh, and they rem removed the bandstand that was uh, directly aft on the center line, and removed like just basically one table, or added just one table, excuse me, to remove uh, a, a, some dressers. Uh, for cab uh, for, for China and a nice uh, upright piano that we believe was then later added to Titanic because when a piano was eventually installed on Olympic, which survives to this day, which matches pictures of the piano that was on Olympic in the restaurants, it's not the same piano. It's a different serial number of the piano. They, re they built, rebuilt a piano in uh, 1912, 1913 to add on Olympic. So we, d we don't understand why they did this instead of using the same piano that was on Olympic before. The only logical explanation for that is that the piano that they originally had in Olympic, which they removed to add the additional tables and seatings, was lost somewhere, and we assume that it was lost on board her sister ship because her sister ship had a nice big giant reception room to use it in which is where 
the new Olympic piano was being installed. End of story. Titanic had an additional piano. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> what a, thank you for your TED talk. <laughs> no, yes, thank you for my TED talk. It's one of those enduring kind of but, like uh, logic mysteries, I call them, where you're like, why, why do they do that? Why is that that way? Yeah, and, why do they do that? Yeah. It's one of those. It's one of those. My mouth full of crackers. Yeah, it's one of those things that I don't know if it can really be disproven. Uh, I mean, unless someone comes up with better evidence, it's mm -hmm. one of those things. Like, where did the piano go? Well, it's something to play with here. It's something we could uh, do. Put a put the piano in the in the restaurant reception room. And incidentally, Olympics, the new piano made for Olympic that was put into her new cafe Parisian. Oh, well, actually, yeah, that's a good segue because we're standing just. Um... Oh yeah, that's perfect. Cafe first. Sorry, you went there first. Where um we are actually approaching the two hour mark. We've probably got about twenty minutes left, and we we had originally intended to look at some of the suites and cabins and things. Um, but as always, we've we've got so into the um public spaces. But this is another fan favorite. I think this room is is similar in some ways to the veranda and palm court above it. In terms of like the trellis and the 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 light and airy nature of the room, no. Yeah, this is, and this is a space which was uh, unique for Titanic compared to her older sister. It was an experimental space, I always wanted to say, because it's still technically an exterior space. Uh, it's it's also, I would also argue, a very inexpensive space that was created, too. Because there's, it's still a steel room. All they're adding is just a little bit of wood to the... Uh, on top of the steel they're just adding trellis and some furniture and bam you got yourself a nice ca a nice uh parisian exterior uh, uh promenade space yeah it still has the wood decking that was because mm -hmm. this was, was of course first class promenade for b deck and um the decking is still there <laughs> what if this has been a uh, second class space uh for promenading that was what was considered somewhat of a flaw of Olympic uh, by uh, who, which who Kyle brought up earlier mm. when in her basket was uh, second class passengers were allowed to promenade all the way f forward past the windows of the restaurants and could look inside and look in as first class passengers were eating their expensive meals. He didn't like <laughs> he didn't approve of that. <laughs> So this area of first class uh, of, of Titanic was going to be exclusively made the restaurant promenade first, and then at a certain time, at a certain time in her uh, fitting out, it was incorporated into the cafe Parisienne from the promenade. So it was I, I, it was taken from second class. I gotta say, well, earlier we were talking about how people back then, you know, they weren't like in the movie; they were human beings. But unfortunately, because they were human beings, they were also still very weird. And I just think it's very funny. So just imagine these people sitting there having their dinners being like, you know, oh my goodness, what are all these second class passengers doing? Looking through the windows and watching me, you know, like, this is just, oh, I gotta, I gotta get my fainting couch. Mm. <laughs> very funny. But because you had so many names traveling on these ships as well, I think that there definitely would have been an element of uh, mm -hmm. kind of like sightseeing, keeping an eye out for a Vanderbilt or an Astor or a Rothschild or something. Um, one of the funny holdovers from this being originally a second class promenade is that the gangway doors are still in place. <laughs> um, yeah, those doors never make any sense. And, then, and it's always no. a difficult question that people ask. They want an answer for these doors and it's like, they're there, and New York City is a thing. I that's the best I can explain for it. Still, yeah. You, know? you imagine actually, this is such a funny place to board the ship. Yeah, but you know, clear the furniture out of the way. I suppose it makes sense. Another, yeah, yeah. it still could, it still could work. There's an entrance right yeah. here. Yeah, first class. Yeah, I mean, it, it does. It yeah, it, it does work as an entrance. Go into the grand staircase. It works the same way it does forward on B deck, except it's on one side. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Hey, um, does anyone need a haircut? Uh, oh yes, yes actually, actually down to the bar bar shop. We buy a postcard. Yeah, 
I mean, there's nothing in there now. But maybe in Project 401, we'll have some nice props in here. But for buy now, a flag. Buy some, I need some toothpaste as well. It's a it's a funny one because um, again, this is kind of like a, a a crossover or something similar to to modern day cruise the modern day cruise ship experience. But uh, the idea of a gift shop was kind of not really fully fleshed out yet, and so this essentially also functioned as Titanic's gift shop, right? gift shop and there's a, there's always a uh, a shop on a cruise ship where if you forgot something like if you forgot a toothbrush your toothpaste your mouthwash you forgot like your shaving cream well you didn't just, if you forgot shaving cream you don't shave back then but if you forgot like some soap or whatever i don't know you come down here and and purchase it I believe, you know, how one of the artifacts, m multiple artifacts raised from the Titanic's wreck site were uh, little jars of um, toothpaste. I, I don't, in, a lot, it, often it's said that those jars of toothpaste, ceramic jars with the, um, I think it was Queen Victoria, I'm not, I'm not sure of who's on the lid of the jars right now, were souvenir jars. I think they were for sale in the, in the barber shop. If you need some yeah. toothpaste, go to the go to the barber shop and uh, and purchase the the toothpaste. A uh, couple of things. So first of all, somebody's really bothered by a question about the plants in the cafe. Uh, they're fake. They're just fake. Uh, the the vines are fake. They're and... fake vines. They're made out of um, wire and wax paper. And the other were in Titanic, not in the game. In in Project Four Hundred One, they're made out of ones and zeros. And now, now the other thing is earlier you a moment ago you mentioned uh, you know, uh, you, uh, they they wouldn't get shaving cream, they wouldn't shave if they wanted to shave or just get their hair cut. Obviously, this is where they would do it, right? They'd sit in these chairs, they'd cut their hair, or they would sh use the barber would do the shaving, right? Yeah, the barber would do the shaving. You don't go here and shave yourself. How, unprof how how uncivilized. <laughs> of course, one of the interesting things found floating in the debris field um, after the sinking is this uh, barber pole, no? Mm-hmm. Has the that resurfaced? Yeah, that, mm -hmm. that, that, and that's because when the ship broke apart, this area, this staircase, was right in the middle of where the entire midsection of the ship just kind of fell apart as it split in two. So all of this got just completely shattered into thousands of pieces and exposed to the open ocean and just broke apart. So there's a lot of stuff in here that would have just, it doesn't exist on the wreck anymore. It's uh, some of it, you yeah. know, like this bark pole, it just floated out of the ship. Cause it's made of wood. Mm. It's not like a, 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 a moving barbershop pole that you see uh, with the circ the one that, that rotates around. And for the Americans in the chat, uh, it's this is correct. The colors in the United States, we added the blue uh, to the barbershop pole because we're patriotic, by the way. <laughs> the, um, so the, it was spotted Freedom. but not recovered from the from the the wreck's debris field on the surface. Is that right? It was not recovered. I'm sorry. What the um, the, barber the barbershop pole, pole recovered? Yeah, was it recovered? No, it was, or was, it was spotted. It, it was not recovered. It was just seen on the morning of the disaster by. Um, I believe it was Arthur Pushin, uh as he was rowing towards, either he was rowing towards uh, Carpathia or he was on the deck of Carpathia. He was, uh, he just noticed it in the water floating. I believe it was Arthur Pushin, or it could have even been Cardinal. It was a, it was a, one of the men who had the, um, the title Colonel or Major. I'm not sure which one of the, what, which one of them it was. Someone in, in chat could probably tell us really quickly um but yeah they just saw it floating on the surface and they and they realized that that was the barbershop pole that was down at the bottom of sea deck Amazing. uh and in in their mind they didn't see the ship break apart so they just thought like you know the the tremendous forces the water that must have flown through the ship to to bring up that barbershop pole were so intense so incredible that that ship must have gone through so much trouble, you know, or there must have, you know, the, 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 the tremendous suction, the tremendous, like, 
low. This is also when they hear the, the, the noises of the ship breaking apart, and in their minds, oh, the boilers are breaking free of their beds and crashing through the ship. Mm. You know, log- in their, logically, something else was happening. Yeah. It would be hard to fathom that mm-hmm. th- the ship had something of that scale breaking into pieces. Or bre- we say in half, it wasn't really in half, but breaking apart like that is uh, it's still hard to imagine the scale it of is. that, you know. Shocking. Yeah. Well, oh, we could uh we could see another space that's I guess semi public. Uh what's on the other side of the stairs there? Another another door. This is this is good though, because this actually does blend into what life was like for first class passengers, because typically you weren't travelling alone. You had somebody with you. A love joy, if you will. A love joy. Or a Trudy. Or your kids. I also I also believe your children. The first and class children is, ate here. Yeah, yeah, and this is where Lovejoy and Trudy would eat. Mm-hmm. And Ro- and Rose's mother's maids, who she sends down to warm up the heaters or whatever, and then they die. But yeah. A a surprisingly and- comfortable space. Yeah. Uh we have little to no idea besides just that it had like oak and white paneling and some chairs like this. So mm. this is an, an interpretation of it based on like other ships and some, some design. I mean, I, when I interpreted this space, I took a, I took an Olympic panel that we, we that we had from Hoth whistle from the paint factory. When Olympic was scrapped um, in the thirties, her paneling was sold and spread across the, the United Kingdom, well, essentially. And one panel, that panel that's like right in front of you, Mike, that's kind of funny, uh, oh. right there with that little oh. wall socket, that panel uh, has been a mystery for a long time to us. And we kept looking at it and, think, and we kept thinking, it's not, for, it's not from any, it was just sold again on like eBay or somewhere, uh, stripped of paint. And we, we looked at it and we, and we thought like, it's not from any stateroom. It's... It, where is it from? Where could it possibly be? We know it's Olympic because it was at the paint factory. So I I tried to interpret some uh, room that it could be, and I I threw it into uh, the Maids and Valet Saloon after looking at other ships. And lo and behold, this is what we've come up with. And I, I, I like what I have here so far. Uh, it's not too far from what I've seen on other ships made uh, designed by Harlan and Wolf and done for the White Star Line. Though I don't think it's that far from uh, what could have been on Titanic. You know, this is this goes into my whole um, uh, motto of what was said in Jurassic Park, where I, I have some of the DNA and I'm stealing DNA from other frogs to complete the, the dinosaur that is Titanic. This yeah. is what we have. Yeah, it's an interesting approach. Because, you know, so there's sometimes you just have to make the call. Um, yeah. This little room that branches off is an interesting one. We've got the king presiding over uh, proceedings. Long, What's this one here? Long live, long live the king. Oh, it's, uh, sorry, it is the Marconi uh, officers and the postal workers saloon. Because now, that, now we're in a, another uh, kind of weird place where we have crew but not crew uh, and where they eat. Just similar to uh, the restaurant yeah, be- staff. Yeah, because of course the Marconi guys, they didn't work for the White Star Line. They weren't crew. They worked for the Marconi company and they they were just employees of that company. And the postal guys Oh no. Yeah, the postal guys, they weren't crew either. They were just uh they were just uh Royal Mail and I think US also service employees or whatever. Marconi to killed the demo. I looked at Marconi yeah. and the game died. <laughs> Marconi, why did Marconi kill the demo? It's it's hilarious oh, that no. uh, and, uh, Marconi, the father of like one of the most important electrical developments of the 20th century has resulted in my computer just having a little moment. Marconi basically invented the internet and he just destroyed the demo. Why did he not agree with this? We all know it's oh, not an ocean liner design stream oh, I, I, unless something goes wrong. I, I, 
I guess we have to make a decision here. Do we restart the demo or do we call that a day? We, you know, it's funny. We're we're just on um, two hours, but uh, I'm I'm going to say that that was a good way to kind of uh, forcefully and maybe somewhat expect, unexpectedly, but bring it to a um, bring it to a conclusion because there is so much to talk about. It's so easy to um, to get lost in the ship's interiors, and uh, that's an interesting. Mm-hmm interesting one because yeah again we've got people like the restaurant staff like you were saying who kind of fit somewhere in between you know they're not they're not white star employees and and so having their own dedicated space is still kind of um emblematic of that era of segregation right you're not staff you're not passengers you're not a valet you have your own space yeah there's a few others like that including i think most famously the musicians for titanic so yeah um, quick side note, I guess, is um, if you know we're not going to be seeing any more spaces tonight. Obviously, we didn't get through everything we wanted. Uh, and whenever we do a stream again, I guess we'll see a bunch of cabins and the squash court. Yeah, we've we've kind of done a really good job going over. I think a lot of the um, public rooms now, and it'll be interesting next time. And we'll try and make it less space in between these because people really enjoyed this last time and i really get a blast out of going through it because i learned stuff with you guys as, as well and i have a really great time um the pub the, you know the the not so public spaces the suites and the cabins and things like that um we'll go through them go through them next time but uh, I'm, I'm sure i speak on behalf of everyone who tuned in today that uh what you guys have accomplished here is pretty remarkable i know the titanic honor and glory team is working relentlessly trying to you know, bring the ship back to life. Derek's work, putting all this in engine and bringing it to life. It looks real. Um, there are times where you just are tricked into thinking that this is the, a, a photograph, not a, a 3D rendering. So um, guys, it was great having you, uh, having you here. Were there any final thoughts? I want to make sure I didn't miss anything, but uh, was there anything you guys wanted to cover before we, uh, before we sign off for the night? Uh, I just wanted to mention again, that what we've been exploring uh, was uh, Titanic Demo 401. Uh, Titanic Demo 401. It is free. It has about 50%, uh, about half of Titanic. Uh, all the public spaces, pretty much uh, a selection, uh, you know, uh, crew spaces and, and some engineering spaces. Just a whole bunch of stuff. All the some of the best and neatest stuff you can see on Titanic. It, it's in this demo. It is free. You can download it at titanichg.com uh, and, you know, slash project dash 401. Or you, or you just go to the main page, click the project 401 tab, and the, down, the download is on that page. I will put a link in the chat here as well. Just a warning to anyone who's not done it yet and is thinking of going out and doing it. You will lose hours. <laughs> you will lose hours looking around uh, and and look at all the detail. And of course, you know, as Derek said earlier, you will need a fairly recent PC because it uses UE5, Unreal yeah. Engine 5. It uses Lumen, or not Lumen, but uh, it uses Nanite. And that, it doesn't like old PCs. Yeah, you need a fairly recent uh, graphics card, especially. Um, it will not work on a non-gaming system, so it, it needs to have a, a built like a dedicated uh, graphics card yeah, it in it for it resource, to run. Resource heavy, but you know what? Understandable because you have recreated half of a uh, forty-five thousand ton ocean liner. If you are not capable of uh, running the game, fear not, because you can just join us next time when we continue to tour more of the titanic's interiors we'll show you all of it and give you as many interesting little facts as we can along the way so thank you everybody very much for joining us tonight we had a wonderful time as always i have disabled super chats because there was just so much to get through we we aren't able to approach them but i did notice that while we've been having a look through some of you guys have been um sending sending donations through and things like that joining the memberships and i'm sorry i didn't really get time to uh address those tonight but i want to say a huge thank you i saw matthew burns left a couple of tips there and some of you guys have been chiming in so as always thank you so much we we uh really just do this for the enjoyment of it um and i'm i feel extremely privileged to get the uh the thg guys onto the channel and to get to show off some of their really remarkable 
work and also show some of the gaps in my own knowledge because you know what i'm just, i'm i'm happy to admit i'm always learning about these ships and uh i can think of no better way to learn uh how it all worked so guys thank you so much for joining us to the audience thank you very much um wonderful to have you with us we'll do this again in the next few weeks i'll try and organize something with the thg guys um matt Derek, kyle thank you very much for joining us it's been a pleasure we'll thanks for having soon. us mike good thank to see you guys. very much have a good night everyone signing off <laughs>